Hey everyone, welcome to The Drive Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Atia. Peter, Bill, how are you guys doing? Doing all right. All doing right. good. This is the first time we've ever done three people in person, so we'll see how it goes, but uh, it should be fun, and I think what we're here to talk about is the book. So by the time this comes out, the book will be out, which is still kind of crazy to think about, more so for probably both of you who have been much more involved in the process than me. But I think what we did is we collected a ton of questions from the audience on wanting to understand the process of the book, who Bill is, what the cover means, what's talked about, all of that stuff. And so we collected those questions. We're going to cover them today, and it should be kind of a fun way to learn more about the book, what's involved, kind of that inside baseball story about it. So with all that said, I think the first thing we should start with is, Peter, how's the voice doing? Uh, I would say it is like 80% of the way back to normal. Do you want to tell people who are maybe unfamiliar how the book tried to kill you through your voice? I think the book has tried to kill us in many ways, <laughs> but I think most recently, um, between reading the book for the audio book and then getting some virus and then having a hectic travel schedule to try to do some podcasts, I basically just developed the worst case of laryngitis and a, had a pharyngeal abscess that, uh, caused my vocal cords to stop working. <laughs> oh, yeah. Which in your profession, you kind of need. So it's good that they're made their way back. Yes. But I will say this. I really enjoyed not speaking for two weeks. Sort of a vow of silence kind of thing. I mean, it was just amazing. I was like, it was amazing how many things I got to tune out. Like people would, I'd hear people call my name and I'd be like, well, I can't do anything about it. So I'm just going to sit here. How, how did the family take that? Did they oh, use they that loved to their it. advantage? Oh, they absolutely loved it. The boys were, what was really funny was the first couple of days, everybody else got very quiet in response to me being quiet. So I, I actually, it's a very interesting, um, one of the few times social media turned out to be insightful and helpful. Um, after I posted, I think the second video of the direct laryngoscopy, someone, uh, a very astute, actually a several, several commenters said, Hey, Peter, by the way, don't whisper. Cause that was basically all I could do. I could go like, I can sort of do this. And they said, don't whisper. Whisper is a bad form of phonation. It's actually teaching you the incorrect movements. Either don't speak or speak normally, but at the lowest volume possible. And I was like, that sort of, I was like, well, that really makes a ton of sense because my, my throat was actually starting to hurt from all the whispering. It was, you know, utilizing yeah. muscles incorrectly and stuff like that. So anyway, so I'm talking very quietly and my boys who, as you know, are not, you can use a lot of words to describe them. Quiet is not, would not be on those lists. Definitely not one of them. <laughs> they got so quiet in response to me being quiet that I was like, we got, I got to figure <laughs> out a way to, in, to just do this enduringly. Yeah. When, next time you have like people over, you need to just be under control. You're yeah, just going to, oh, dad can't talk to you. Yeah. So you, you learned a, a parenting hack. Yes, totally. The quieter you are the with quiet. your kids, the quieter they are back. Treatment. Nice. Well, one of the questions that we'll get to later is, will you ever write a second book? Which you say no. I'm curious what Bill thinks. But maybe if you do, that could be the, the parenting hacks <laughs> one-on-one. Just lose your voice. Um. So I think we'll kind of get into it and we have a lot of questions to get through, but the first one, which I think makes the most sense on which to start with, which is relevant to the book sitting in front of us and the cover is, I think people would ask, you know, we understand outlive and what that means, but where does the science and art of longevity come from and why was that so important to include in the title? Well, I mean, you know, the, the, the title was actually an evolution. So the, um, the first title I had in mind when I wrote my manifesto, which was an awful title, but it was the Longevity Manifesto, which of course, for obvious reasons, got scrapped immediately. But the working title during, call it 2016, when we were shopping the proposal around was The Long Game. So that was kind of the working title that pretty quickly got replaced by Outlive for I think obvious reasons. And I think I've talked about why I like that title so much and why, I don't know, we never really even questioned it. Right. I don't think there was ever a point where we thought of something else for the main title. Yeah. I mean, I think 
there was a moment when I think a previous publisher questioned it. Yeah. But I think it's it's just very evocative and it's very simple. Um, and it's an action. Yeah. Yeah. And you think, you know, it could mean different things to different people, but I think of like, you're going to outlive your expectations or outlive your parents or your grandparents. Your fate is not set in stone is kind of, yeah. kind of the idea. So to your question about the subtitle, um, you know, art and science is a pretty common term. People understand that this is the art and science, this is the art and science, but I felt that there were two things that needed to be communicated. One, the study of human longevity is part science and part art, but the science should come first. So that's why I wanted to flip that order and say it's the science and art of longevity. Um, and I think in the book, we make a pretty good case for for where where the application of each comes, right? Why this is not, you know, if this were, you know, if this were a book about mouse longevity, it could just be the science of longevity. Because in mice, you can do all of the definitive experiments and answer all these questions. And in humans, as is readily apparent, we will never know definitively uh, what, what the answers are. And therefore, we always have to have some art involved. So Peter, another question we got is, you often talk about longevity having two components, the lifespan piece, which is how long you live, and the health span piece, which is how well you live. The lifespan piece is kind of covered a little bit with the outlive, um, but we did get a question of someone wondering, was it purposeful that health span didn't make the title or kind of what was the thought process there? I see, I think outlive encompasses both, truthfully. I, I think, you know, to Bill's earlier comment, um, outliving is more than about the um, chronological years of life. It's about the quality of life as well. And so I think next, the most common question we got as it related to the cover is, can you explain the cover art? And I know for those listening or watching, it went through a lengthy process of a lot of different iterations. So do you maybe kind of want to talk about that, why you ultimately settled on this and kind of to you what it means? Yeah, I think um, the cover is interesting because there were, there were two things that in the back of my mind were enormous stressors as we got closer and closer to the finish line. Um, and by that, I mean, basically by about the spring of 2022, so about a year, exactly a year ago, you know, we had a manuscript that was, we knew it was too long. It was probably about 190,000 words at that point. So we knew it was going to get a big haircut, but we knew we basically had the book at that point. But these two things that kind of nagged at me and kept me up at night were, how could this be represented in a cover? And who is going to read this book for the audio book? Those two things just created such a low level anxiety for me. I can't even, you know, talk about it. And so <clears throat> as the spring turned into the summer and our publisher is like, okay, like we need to get on this cover thing. And they've got kind of a checklist of, okay, for the book to come out in March, we have to have this thing designed by here and da, 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 da. Um, I just didn't even have a sense of what one does because I couldn't, you know, as Bill can say, I have very strong opinions about everything. I couldn't even offer an opinion on the cover, right? All I could say was I want it to be elegant. I want it to be kind of timeless. I don't want it to be too busy. Like I had vague ideas of what I wanted. And as you know, I'm a font fanatic. So I kind of understood the fonts I wanted, but no sense artistically of what was wanted. So then Bill, uh, sent, this is probably August, right? Yeah, he sent yeah. over an email of a guy named Rodrigo Carell, who I'd never heard of before, but you sent yeah, over, I think yeah. his website. Yeah. My sister is a book designer and he's like a big, He's revered in, in those circles. And we looked at some of his designs. Yeah. And, and they I really kind of the popped, books, right? And I was like, yes. Yeah. This that's is the elegant. guy, right? This is elegant. And while that's happening in parallel, the publisher is churning out um, designs as well. And I'm kind of like, okay, there's a couple of these that are, I could see iterating on. Um, and, 
basically we were we just we, we weren't really making a ton of progress until we I think just collectively decided and and really I I think uh, Bill has contributed a lot of things to the project but if I was going to say the single most important thing Bill contributed was being adamant that we engage with Rodrigo and this was late in the game this was October if I'm not mistaken and I remember where I was I was on a flight and I got an email from Bill and um it was said something to the effect of because we were looking at something that I was almost going to capitulate on. It was a design. I remember what the design was. And I basically was saying, it's a solid seven out of ten, and I'm too tired to do anything about it. And Bill was like, This is bullshit, man. We've worked way too hard on this book to have a seven out of ten cover. I think we just we just we just we go and get Rodrigo and it doesn't matter how much it costs and it doesn't matter how much it slows the process down. We do it. And I was like, yeah, Bill's right. I don't want to regret this. I don't want to, I don't want to be sitting here in 10 years going, ah, why did we do that? So then we reached out to Rodrigo, had a long call with him. And I guess this is what makes great artists, great artists is even having this call just talking with him about the book. He didn't have a chance to read the whole book because it's long. And I mean, within three days, he threw up 30 covers. And they're all different. Totally different. They're all sort of evocative. I mean, there were some there were some images that I liked and that you liked and other people liked, and but different ways to kind of evoke this concept of longevity and outliving and um living better and all that stuff, which, I mean, it's really easy to also get that wrong visually. Yeah. Like the, I was telling Nick about the Korean cover of, uh, of my book, Spring Chicken, that portrays a fat guy on a beach chair, like frying an egg. And that's supposed to mean longevity. So there's many ways it can go off the rails. <laughs> so I think he, there was something about this and and I think I don't think this was your favorite at first. It wasn't either. at first. It was, but it was in my top six. So I yeah. remember he sent over 30. And I think we each decided to pick our top five or top six. This was on for all of us. It had a very different font. There were a number of things about it that were different at the time. And I think the font threw me off the first time around. Font guy. Yeah, yeah. font guy. I'm very particular about my fonts. And to make a very long story short. Yeah we ultimately decided this was the one we were going to make the winner. And, you know, I wish I could sit here and tell you that the blue, green, yellow, pink all signify something. I, I can't tell you that. What I can tell you is it signifies a bunch of things to me, right? It signifies kind of a keyhole that you're walking through. It's a passage. Um, but it also looks like a target. And that's a big part of this. There's a very subtle theme in this book about lots of metaphors that revolve around archery. Um, anyway, I could talk about it at length. I'm not sure, Bill, what, what you well, think. Well, it's, it's different. I showed it to different people, like my partner, Martha, and various other people. And everybody kind of liked it, but they had a different reason. Mm. They say, I like it because it's like an aura. Yeah, I like it because it's like you're going into the into the beyond into, yeah. into the future or, you know, the little guy there, let's not forget him. Yep. He's an important part that was of the design. Addition. So it's different yep. things to different people. And that spoke to the art side of it, science and art. So. And I think that that's, I, I can, I think that it speaks to what art is, right? Art means different things to different people. And, and in that sense, I think the cover, I, I just wanted a cover that I would like to look at. And, um, I have certain books that I love looking at their covers. And so I wanted this to be one of them. Yeah. And it, it is interesting too, as you kind of mentioned, like what makes Rodrigo so good. And when we saw that list of 30, you were just, every time you would look at another one, you're like, this could easily be yeah. it. This there literally wasn't a bad one on his yeah. list of 30. No. That's the thing. Like no. every one of those was reasonable. And there were a handful that were exceptional. And there was one that was perfect. Yeah. Yeah. It just shows people who are experts at their craft, how good they are and how they can think so differently. And this cover, yeah, it turned out 
really, really well. And I think I drove everybody absolutely insane with all the font changes <laughs> I made. <laughs> I was going to say, I think to say you're fanatic about fonts does not do it justice how fanatic you are about fonts. Yeah. One little inside baseball thing here. If you go with this font, the commas work out to be much cruder. And so I was like, nope, we can't do that. We have to use a different font for the comma because the, the comma I really wanted to be serif to a sans serif font otherwise. And everyone was like, I mean, only Rodrigo was like, yeah, that totally makes sense. Everyone else was like, Jesus Christ. Yeah. Everyone, go. <laughs> everyone else was like, this comma is going to cost this book not actually getting done because the cover won't be done on time. Um, so I think it kind of pivots to the next question. And Bill, you hinted at it a little bit, but a lot of people were kind of curious, you know, who is Bill Gifford? Like, what's his backstory? How did he get involved in the book? So do you kind of want to give a little rundown of kind of who you are, your story, and then ultimately how you initially got connected with Peter and the project, which was six years ago now. Oof, it was um, end of 2017. End of 17. Yeah. Yeah. I got an email out of the blue. For me, right? Yeah. 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 And I, I knew who you were because I had read your, you know, I knew who you were. And I'd, I think in particular, I'd read your insane 13 part. Oh, series cholesterol. about cholesterol. Yeah, 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 I was like, right, this is epic. Uh, and in, I had read that in the course of researching my own sort of more personal book about longevity, Spring Chicken, which came out in 2015. I thought I was done with longevity, honestly, but this seemed interesting. But sort of to reel back, I'm, I'm, um, you know, like where other kids' dads were throwing the football passing the old baseball around like my dad took me to the library so i became a, a writer eventually and i just love writing and words and i thought i would be a like a poet at one point when i was in college but then i, I realized i like writing to people and sort of connecting with people and evolved um from sort of general journalism into writing more and more about sort of scientific and medical topics and writing about like sports performance and then doping and cycling and then more general health related topics. And then got interested in like Peter did, you know, you reach a certain age and you're like, huh, what is happening here? You know, I'm not the guy I was 10 years ago. And there's this interesting process going on. That's this big sort of biological mystery. It's super fascinating. And it has not been solved. It still has not been solved. Um, so yeah, so ended up writing about longevity. And I ended up writing, I write a lot about athletes too. So I found myself writing about older athletes as well. Like Phil Mayer, the skier, came back to racing when he was 50. So I followed him around and he was competing against 22-year-olds. So, so that, kind of, that kind of longevity kind of fascinates me as well. And Peter, I actually don't know if I know the story, but you mentioned you first reached out to Bill. So what caused you to do that throughout the writing process? Well, so in 2016, I was working with an agent. Uh, this book got sold to a different publisher. And, um, you know, I was the author of the book and um, I'm working on it nights and weekends, you know, while I'm doing my day job. And I finally have kind of the first part of the book to submit. It was just under 40,000 words. And I submit it to my agent who then submits it to the publisher. Now, by this point, the editor who had bought the book had left. So there's this woman um, who was at the who's at the publisher and I, I seem to like her and I, I I thought I thought she really got the concept of the book. But unfortunately, and I guess this is not uncommon in publishing, within a couple months of me coming on with the publisher, she gets a better job at another publisher. So she's gone. So now another, another editor basically comes on. And it's now her book, but she doesn't really have as much invested in it. And so I submit this first section to them and it is met with a very lukewarm response. Um, and they really had two huge criticisms of it. Um, the first was it's too technical. Um, and I, you know, I, I can, I can see, see why that's the case. 
The second was there was no story in it, right? There was no narrative. It was mostly just a scientific treatise on the subject matter. And so then my, I guess both my agent and the publisher said, look, we think you should bring a co-author in who can help massage and smooth this out and make it, you know, a, a better book for the lay person to read. So I said, okay, how, how do we go about doing that? And they said, we've got a long list of people to introduce you to. I said, great. So sure enough, the courting began and every, this is back when I was in New York constantly because I was, you know, this, you know, this is back when I traveled a lot to, to work there. And so basically every week that I'm in New York, I'm meeting another author. And usually what would happen is they would send me one of their books. I'd you know, read as much of the book as I could get through or skim it or something and then sit down with them. Um, and I kind of went through five or six of these and it just, I was like, there's no way this person gets it. Like this person has no clue what I'm trying to write about and this is not going to work. So then I talked to Bob Kaplan and I said, Bob, here's the problem. What do you, do you have any ideas? He goes, yeah, let's, let's go find somebody who's already written about what <laughs> you find interesting and see. And the very first thing that I remembered, what year did you write that Bloomberg piece on rapamycin? Was that 2015? So I think that came out um, 2015, yeah, yeah, early. So 2015. And it, it's actually interesting that you wrote it back then because this was still sort of pre-hype of geroscience. Yeah. But there was an article in Bloomberg yeah, I guess 2015 that, you know, because I was obsessed with this stuff, I read everything that came out. And this was the first one that I read that I was like, this is a very good article. Most of them were so simplistic. They just missed the point. But this was a very good article. Um, and so I said to Bill, I, mean, I said to Bob, I said, this is the guy. Because he already gets it. I'm not going to have to like, you know, explain to him this, that, or the other thing. Or at least I said, like, my intuition is that he will get it. And I don't, did I contact you through Twitter? How did I, I do remember reaching out to you. Was it through your website or I through think your you just emailed me. Yeah, 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 yeah. So somehow yeah. I just got Bill's email. Maybe it was on the article. And I, I, I don't remember what the email said, but I do remember we met for dinner on the Upper East Side one yeah. day in late 2017. Yep. And I think I probably just said everything I just said now, which is, you know, and, and, and by that point, so what did I send you to read? What was the version I had sent you at that point? I think it wasn't the 38,000 yeah, yeah, yeah. words. It was more that. like. I think I probably by that point. It was point kind of the gone, proposal. It was yeah. like 5,000 yeah, yeah. something. And, you know, some interesting, I was just thinking about it. Like, I think some of the DNA of that is definitely in part one. Yep. Like if you did a, you know, text analysis, you'd probably find some bits of that sprinkled in there. It, you know, it had the sort of the central, central ideas in, in part one. Yeah. So you I, had I, a start, but you know, starting is super hard and then keeping going is even harder. And then figuring out that you're done is the hardest of all. But so you had a start. I had no idea how hard this would be. I mean, I, I, I I'm sure every <laughs> first time author says that. But this was so much more difficult, so much more time consuming um, than, than anything I could have imagined. Um, I do remember in the early days, we spent a lot of time in front of a whiteboard. Indeed. In my office. Yes. And that was the easiest way for me to communicate kind of broad strokes was, um, you know, this is how I think of these as pillars. This is how I think of these as foundations. This is this, this is that. Yeah, we had a and, lot of pillars and foundations. Yeah. Frameworks. Uh, lots of frameworks. And I feel like that was kind of the easiest way, I think, to get us on the same page about how I was thinking about it. But the structure that emerged in the final book, which is basically, you know, three big sections that communicate, you know, each important and builds on the other. I feel like that didn't really crystallize until 
gosh, I mean, 2019, I don't, 2018 is a blur to me, <laughs> right? Like I don't, I don't remember the, the difficulty. I mean, I do in some ways, but, but clearly there was a, so ver, if version one of the book was what we just talked about, the sort of pre-bill, then there was version two, which was the book that got written basically from the beginning of 2018 through the beginning of 2020. Yeah. Yeah. And it, even in that period, so the two things I remember, first of all, I remember you ordered about half the menu at that Turkish restaurant <laughs> and the waiter was like all for you. This was back when I was eating just one meal a yeah. day. So, oh, yeah. so it was like, I would fast all day and then basically throw down 3000 calories at dinner. Yeah. So I was like, this is whatever this is going to be. It's not going to be dull. <laughs> and, um, then the other thing is sort of, we had a, a basic template. We kind of outlined, okay, what's the book going to be? It's going to be, you know, 25% kind of this part one, this kind of the manifesto stuff. Mm -hmm. And then it, it was going to be basically a biology of aging book. I mean, that was kind of where, where we were going, you know, the rapamycin stuff and the kind of mechanisms that, that, you know, the hallmarks of aging, mm -hmm. you know, it, it almost like the molecular, you know, cellular level stuff. And then we were like, you were like, um, uh, oh, you know, 10% tactics. I didn't want any tactics in it. Yeah, I maybe 5% no tactics. tactics. We're, we're that, making an appendix with a couple tactics yeah, in it. You know, we have 200 pages on tactics. <laughs> what did the publisher say when you said, I'm oh. actually not going to tell anyone what to do in no, this no, book? They were, they were, they were apoplectic. <laughs> <laughs> and what do you, so, you know, you mentioned it was so hard to kind of write and it obviously took a very long time. What do you think was so hard about the process? Was it translating the science into something that was more of a story? Was it figuring out how to verbalize the frameworks? Was it just getting what was in your head cohesively on paper? I think there are a couple of things. So first of all, I love writing. I've been, you know, been blogging for, for as long as I can remember, but that's a very different style of writing. You know, Bill was talking about my 13 part cholesterol series you don't have any constraints when you're blogging. You can go as deep as you want to go because you are attracting an audience of similar weirdos who are going to go as far down the rabbit hole as you will take them. And so I think the biggest struggle I had switching to this kind of writing, and it's so funny for me to look at this version of the book now and compare it to what I was writing in 2018. And I remember Bill really tolerated a lot of my stupid things that I was writing and, and what the basic, basically how he tolerated it was he made a lot of footnotes. He was like, <laughs> all right, I really want to delete Let's all of this, this in a but we're going to make it a footnote. And of course, four years later or three years later, I was the one deleting those footnotes. And I was like, this is so gratuitous. Like it doesn't matter that much. And, and that to me is a remarkable evolution, I guess, that everyone has to go through. You know, Bill presumably went through this 30 years ago, right? But for me, that was new. That was like, no, but I do need to ex explain the extracorporeal circulation of the liver in this section. And Bill is like, I don't think that's really important. And I was like, no, no, Bill, you don't understand. If the reader doesn't understand portal blood flow here, they will never understand why glycogen gets there. And he's like, Peter, I can assure you there are seven people who give a shit about that. <laughs> and I was like, no, no, Bill, it's important. He's like, all right, let's make it a footnote. Fine, let's make it a footnote. I was pissed. <laughs> and then, of course, two years later, I'm like, that's so goddamn irrelevant. Get rid of it. But you have to know it, though, be, to be able to yeah. write intelligently. Like, you have to know it, and you have to know what's going on. And But then you also have to decide, like, like you have to know. It's You know, you're talking about, like, getting in the weeds, right? Yeah. And you have to know all the weeds to write well about science, but then you also have to, and I think ultimately we both got pretty good at this, like get pretty harsh about like what you're going to leave out. And we left out a lot of stuff. Like I mean, so the, much. It, it's like stories what, it's and this, it's science. The, it's the, yeah. it's the uh, I mean, I think I've told this story before, but I remember when I was writing probably my first or second scientific paper, you, you do a lot of experiments most of which don't make it into the paper. 
And I forget who it was that told me this. I think his name was Dan Powell. It was one of the postdocs that I was in the lab with. And he said, you just have to learn how to kill your babies. You're, you're going to yeah, throw out 90% of yeah. this. And I just think that that for me was hard. Getting to that point of, but will the reader, if the reader doesn't know all of this you know, stuff below the surface, can they appreciate the piece of the iceberg above? And I, I think ultimately the readers will determine the, if, if we've struck that balance correctly. I think we have. Um, and I'll tell you why I think so. I think it became readily apparent when I read the audio version of the book. Because when you're reading it out loud, it's very different from when you read it the way one edits their own writing. Because you're, you're, you're obviously reading it much slower and you realize the unnecessary interruptions of endless yep. footnotes that are, you know, incremental in what they're adding. Yeah, it's kind of, it's interesting to hear you talk about it because I can't imagine, I haven't read the first iteration, which I think you said practically none of it made the final version, right? Certainly in direct content, absolutely not. In spirit, some of it, but yeah. I just can't imagine what it was is if you handed them a whole manifesto, zero tactical advice, and literally explaining every little nuance of the liver, like I would just love to see the face of the person who came in after that publisher left and read this and just was like, what the hell are we going to do with this thing? I'm, I'm sure they were freaking out. So I, I think it makes sense to kind of talk a little bit. You mentioned it there, but there's three main parts of this book, right? So let's talk about what ultimately made it into this final version. Do you kind of want to walk through what the structure of the book is, kind of some of the content? So we don't have to get into detail, but just kind of what people can expect to read about. Yeah, I mean, look, there's three parts. Uh, I think the first part sets up the structure of the book. It gets the frameworks across. You'll certainly, uh, as a reader, understand the problem statement, right? And and I, again, I think you can't solve or even attempt to solve complicated problems if you aren't asking the right questions and you don't have the right frameworks. That's something that we posit very clearly here. And that's really what part one is about. And that's not just explaining what longevity is and isn't, but it's explaining something called medicine 3.0, which is the vehicle through which you pursue this thing. Then um, part two, um, but sorry, I guess the other thing in part one is we, I'm, I'm blanking on where the delineation occurs, but I think part one also includes kind of some of the scientific underpinning, doesn't it? Or does that all get lumped in part two? I think that's part two with it's, the horse. That's part two. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah so so that part two is probably the most technical part of the book where we get into the scientific underpinning of everything coupled with get to know your opponents basically. Right. So, so there's no denying this. A big part of this book is trying to figure out how to live longer. Now, not in terms of science fiction, living longer, but I mean, I think we argue very convincingly that a person reading this book who puts these principles into practice is, is, is really thinking about it, elongating their life by five to 10 years. But to do that, you really have to understand what are the things that are coming to take your life. So we kind of go through all that in part two. Um, and then part three is how do you put this into practice? It is that which I initially didn't want to write about, but ultimately think, um, I, I, I don't know. I, I think that, I think that section just turned out better than I ever could have imagined it. Yeah. It kind of organically evolved and kept growing and, um, changing. Uh, but you know, it, it, going back to part two, I think we were, we were looking at, um, you know, cause we're both fascinated by centenarians. We were looking at that chapter and kind of hammering out that chapter. And we kind of had a little bit of a revelation where it was like, wait, how, it's not like a big mystery how these people live to a hundred when most people live to 80, you know, they get heart disease much later, if at all, they get cancer much later, if at all, or maybe never. And they get neurodegenerative disease 
neurodegenerative disease later or never. And so it's kind of like that's the ball game, right? You've got to figure out how to delay all of those diseases, that, which you call the horsemen, right? So then we had to, and we didn't even contemplate writing these chapters at the beginning. And then we decided, oh, we have to, because we have to, like, like you say, like know, know the enemy, know the opponent. That's right. Yeah, the first version of this, which is the first version that we wrote, which is the second version of the book, was way heavier in the molecular science yeah. of aging. So we came at this much more through, let's go really deep into autophagy. Let's go really deep into nutrient sensing pathways. Let's go really deep into all of these things, which of course I found super interesting. But um, ultimately we pivoted much more towards this insight, which is there are two completely different strategies to live long. One is figure out a way to extend the period of time you live once you have a disease. And by the way, that's everything Medicine 2.0 does. We're going to wait till you have a disease and we're going to figure out a way to just drag you through that and keep you from dying. Okay, that strategy's worked a little bit. Strategy two, which is Medicine 3.0, is no way. We have to figure out the time. We have to figure out a way to drag out the time you live without a disease. And to understand, you can't enter, you can't play that game if you don't know everything about these diseases. You have to become so intimately familiar with each of the horsemen. And um, and of course, therefore, each of those horsemen has a very robust chapter. As I'm listening to you talk, I'm kind of curious, do you think for as tough as it was to write the book and all the pain to go through that process over the years, do you think how you practice medicine with your patients, kind of what we talk about on the podcast, like weekly newsletters, how all that's structured, do you think it would evolve to what it is if you didn't write the book? I, th I mean, I, th I think they help each other for sure. I, I think, um, I mean, you can't write well if you don't think well. Um, and you could argue it's hard to think well if you're not able to write well. So I think there relentless process of streamlining and figuring out how to get to the point sooner, all of those things would absolutely force me to, to reconsider how things were happening. By the way, I think a lot of what's written in there comes out of just the conversations I'm having with patients. I do. I mean, in fact, I, I know there were certain times when I even asked patients, um, Hey, do you mind if I record our zoom today? Um, because I, I just want to be able to go back and listen to how we talked about it. And they'd be like, sure. And so I would, you know, walk them through all of their cardiovascular disease risk and then go back and listen to it after and go, okay, yep. I, this is the way I would, this is, this is a good version of this talk. Cause I give the same talk to patients constantly, but sometimes they're, sometimes they hit better and sometimes they don't. And so having some recordings of those was really helpful to, to kind of go back and remember how, what worked. I think the when you started the podcast, I think it was about six months. Yeah. yeah, it was about six months into the the book writing process. I think that gradually that made you um, more cognizant of of how to communicate science and medical topics. I, I think maybe by nature you're you're a very data driven kind of mathematical guy, and you'll want to maybe just present like numbers and you know facts straight up and i think doing the podcast you kind of learned how to how to how to kind of speak and and you know introduce these subjects in a, in a more sort of user-friendly way it was an interesting progression yeah that's true we did start the um the, the the we started the podcast in june of or yeah june of 2018 and I remember in the summer of 2017, so before we were still working, when I was still working on version one, I was effectively podcasting, but without podcasting. In other oh. words, I was flying around interviewing people, you know, okay. you know, go, going up to Boston to meet with David Sabatini, meeting with Matt Caberlin, meeting with the postdocs in their labs, sitting down and recording these interviews with them. And it was effectively my foray into podcasting without, but it was all for the book. You know, these were all just interviews that were used to sort of drive the book. Um, and yes, what an evolution in that. That's another, we'll save that for another discussion, but boy, how, how difficult podcasting is too. 
And it was, it's kind of funny because some of those initial interviews ended up being some of the first podcasts we released. That's right. I think we did end up using at least three of probably a dozen of those as actual podcasts. And I think too, the interview, the first interview we did with In You Go and Rick Johnson, that stemmed from you wanting to go talk to them for the book. Yeah, yeah. And we just kind of double dipped. Yeah. So it is kind of funny to think about. You know, a lot of those interviews would, would you'd come back and you'd be like, you got to listen to this, Billy. You got to listen to In You Go. And, you know, and so th those fed into the, the, not only the writing of the book, but sort of the evolution of thinking behind yeah. the book. So. And it kind of fits in with a question we got asked quite a bit, which is, it took you six years to write the book. There was a lot that changed in those six years as it relates to science. There's a lot that's going to change in the next 10 years. And you, when you announced the book, you kind of wrote about your goal with this book is it would still be applicable in 10 years. So kind of people were curious, you know, how do you think about one, writing a book that can stand the test of time Two, you know, what changed a lot in your mindset and where did you evolve in that whole process? I mean, I think a lot of things changed in me in, in the six years. Um, some of them just obviously very personal things, some of the, some of which I've written about in the book. Um, but I think more, it has to do with emphasis, right? So there were things at the beginning that were much more the emphasis in my mind and other things became more important over time. Uh, so for example, at the outset of the writing of this book, I probably placed more of an emphasis on nutrition than exercise as one of the important drivers, one of the important levers we have at our disposal. And I would say that my views on that have flipped. I think that exercise has a bigger impact than nutrition. And certainly on the positive side, nutrition can have a pretty big negative impact, but once it's corrected, it doesn't have this enormous upside, whereas exercise has an enormous downside in its absence and an enormous upside in its presence. So that's, you know, that's a, you're, you're reading a different version of this book than you would have read six years ago with respect to that. Um, or two years ago. Yeah, exactly. One year ago. Obviously, you know, a book, this book written five years ago would have not had anything about emotional health. There's not a lot on it, but there's, there's something on it and it's, and I think it's relevant. Um, I think it's very framework focused, which I think lends to a more timeless piece because frameworks or scaffoldings are there upon which to place information and substitute information. So if the framework says delay the time that you do not have disease, that's relatively timeless as a strategy. Now we're going to learn different things about these diseases. I, in 10 years, my hope is that, you know, one, taking yeah. one example, liquid biopsies should be a heck of a lot more valuable in 10 years than they are today. That's going to completely change our approach and our efficacy of screening. So, so you'll have a different tactic that you'll use in a toolkit to go about the strategy, but the goal is still the same. So you're talking about liquid biopsies for cancer detection. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So if you can detect cancer much earlier, it's a treating it's a whole different thing. Yep. Yeah. And it's it's interesting because anyone who's listened to the podcast for a long period of time will know like hear you talk about things in a different way as you learn more information. And I think sometimes a natural reaction from people is to be frustrated at that, being like, well, why did you say this? one time and then you kind of change your mind like you know but i think to what you just said which is really important it's probably worth spending a few minutes on it is you will focus heavily on objective strategy tactic and that's probably the reason why in the initial version it had zero tactics which a lot of people are probably like how do you write a book that doesn't tell people what to do but for you it's how do you write a book that tells people what to do? it's all about objective and strategy because as new information comes in the tactic may change, but the objective and strategy doesn't. Do you kind of maybe want to talk people through how you think about that objective strategy tactic? Because I think it is applicable for anyone who's going to read the book to really understand that 
for knowing how to take this information and still make it applicable years down the road, not just months down the road. Well, there's a whole chapter on it in part one, right? Which is like, why, you know, why is it that we spend so much time hammering this idea? And um, it's a simple concept, but it's amazing how often it's ignored. So for starters, you do have to define the objective. And um, I won't say any more on that now, but again, the objective, you'd be amazed at how many people would struggle to define their objective. You know, oh, I'm taking this 27 different supplements because I'm hacking my, you know, whatever. And it's like, okay, what is your objective? And if you can't clearly state that, then there's so much fog around this. The strategy is very important. And um, again, you know, there's, we open each chapter with a quote, but of the quotes, my favorite has to be the one that opens that chapter, which is the Sun Tzu quote about uh, strategy. Uh, what is it? Is the uh, uh, objectives, uh, sorry, strategy without, uh, tactics without strategy is the noise before defeat or something. That's like, right. It? Yeah. That's it. And um, so, so we go to great lengths using <laughs> lots of examples to really help a person understand the difference between a strategy and then the tactics that they employ. Um, and we do this because we say the tactics are the most malleable things here. They're the things that are going to change the most. And to the, your previous question, those are the things that have already changed the most, right? So I'll give you another example, right? Like how much emphasis did I used to place on fasting? How much emphasis do I place on fasting today? Totally different. Um, the, I am positive that there is some set of drugs that I am either not taking now or don't even know what they are now that I'll probably be taking in 10 years. And similarly, there's probably something I'm taking now that in 10 years, I'm going to say the evidence for this sucks. I'm not going to do it. So, you know, if I can't take that and anchor it back to a strategy, which is the reason I would take this or wouldn't take this is because it feeds into the, one of these three overarching principles that guides this objective, um, then I'm, I'm really just doing a bunch of random things that aren't in concert. But you're also able and open to changing your mind. So, you know, one of the things I noticed early on is like, you're not like a dogmatic person if you get information or a new interpretation of the existing data that kind of causes you to, to see something differently. And fasting is, is a big one. And Frank, I was a little bit relieved actually, because I knew I was going to have to do it myself just to be able to write about it, but <laughs> I wasn't looking forward to it. But then you kind of got off the fasting. I think yeah. it, had, it had served a purpose for you. Yeah. And, there, and again, there's, there's still times when I think it makes sense, but, but yes, it just as one specific example of, you know, this isn't something that everybody needs to be doing. And one of the questions we got was what areas of the book do you think within the next 10 years will evolve the most? You know, you mentioned there like liquid biopsies and cancer detection. Is there anything else that you kind of think about when you write this book? If you're like, if I was going to update this in 10 years and I had to make a guess on which sections I would want to refocus on, is there anything that you would think? Another way to think about it is, you know, what in this sphere are you kind of really excited about progress in the next 10 years? I do think that um, we've taken, we've gone out on a, you know, taken a very aggressive posture on cancer screening, right? For the, for the reason that Bill alluded to a moment ago, which is um, certainly in doing research for this book and getting really deep in the weeds, th there simply is no ambiguity that the earlier you catch cancer, the better your odds are at treating it while it remains local. Um, given the exact same histology of cancer, treating it when there are a billion cells versus treating it when there are a hundred billion cells with the exact same therapy has such dramatically different outcomes that there should be no question about that. And so you, you basically have to put yourself into different camps. Are you of the mindset that we will come up with systemic cures for cancer, regardless of size and stage in the next couple of decades? Or do you think it is more likely that we will get better and better at finding cancer 
when it is smaller and smaller and treating it with existing therapies. Now, those don't have to be mutually exclusive, but the question is which one of those do you think is more likely? And I think the latter is much more likely. And, you know, we present it as such, right? You know, goal number one, don't get cancer. Goal number two, if you do get cancer, catch it as early as possible. And then, and only then, goal number three is we get into what are the most promising things. So I think that's another area where, I, 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 you know, what we're seeing right now with immunotherapy is so exciting. And I think we are right on kind of the verge of unlocking the next layer of immunotherapy, right? Which is once, and, and by the way, I think this gets to another part of your question, which is what else would I be excited about in 10 years that is not in this book? Because I think it's too soon for prime time. But if we could reprogram immune cells, so you've heard a lot of talk about reprogramming. Well, reprogramming gets talked about nonstop and there's so much nonsense there. But there is one subset of the human body that if it could be reprogrammed would change the game and that's the immune cell. If, and, and by the way, that's much easier to reprogram than like, you know, your heart or your liver or things like that, in my opinion, because of how easily we can access those cells. If we could epigenetically reprogram T cells, I, I think it's a totally different game when it comes to cancer therapy and, and cancer incidence. I think, yeah, I... I... I would say maybe uh, neurodegeneration. Yeah, that's like a good if, one too. But but that's someplace where we're we're kind of nowhere in terms of effective treatments for um, Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease. Hopefully, better data on prevention. You know, right now we've taken and we do this in our practice as well. We're taking very much a kitchen sink approach, um, which is there are a handful of things that especially for dementia, less clear for the movement disorders. There are a handful of things that unambiguously reduce your risk of dementia. Um, there seem to be at least three, four, if we were going to be right, clear. Exercise, uh, management of lipids on the AD and dementia side, sleep, and not having diabetes. Those, those things you can take to the bank. We talk about 27 other things for which the data are not clear yet. To have more clarity around that would be great. And as someone who's not in the scientific field, how you talk about cancer makes a lot of sense in the idea of if the goal, like if you have better treatment, the earlier you catch it, you want to screen as early as possible. But you talk about in the book kind of the difference between medicine 2.0 and 3.0 and how that's not the case now. Why, why do you think that's, I don't want to say controversial approach to it, but why is that not the norm? Because from the outside looking in, it's hard to poke holes in that idea. Do you mean why is the traditional view of cancer screening different from kind of the view we present? Yes. Um, I think if I'm going to be fair and charitable to the outside view, it would be that it's being... Uh, we're, we're, we're basically asking two different questions. Okay. So I think the question and the solution that we're proposing is at the individual level. Um, the, the outside view I think is at the, is at the population or societal level. So there was a recent study, um, that got a lot of attention in Europe. I think it was published in the New England Journal of Medicine that looked at, uh, colonoscopies. Um, the study, took a large group of people and they were randomized into two groups. So one group was standard of care, don't do anything. The next group was suggested that they should have a colonoscopy in the next decade. Okay, at the end of the decade, they were compared for rates of colon cancer and colon cancer mortality and all cause mortality. And while there was a slight benefit to the group that were recommended to get a colonoscopy, it was nothing to write home about. The, the relative and absolute difference in colon cancer and colon cancer deaths, while statistically significant, didn't seem very clinically significant. And opponents of colonoscopy said, look, this is proof positive that colonoscopies don't save lives. The route of it is no, it's proof positive that telling people to maybe get a colonoscopy once every 10 years, when by the way, I think less than 40% of them actually did, probably doesn't save lives. That's very different from the example and the approach that we take 
I mean, you know, I'm 50. I've already had three colonoscopies. I, I get them every three years and I will continue to do that until my life expectancy is so short that it becomes irrelevant. And, um, again, totally different approach. Um, so we, we have to, con and, and am I suggesting that, you know, everybody get a colonoscopy every three years? Of course I'm not, right? What I'm suggesting is that everybody think about their own risk reward trade-off and decide what's the, what's the cost benefit analysis. So there's an enormous cost to doing that. My insurance company doesn't pay for most of those. They've paid for one of the three. Um, there are risks of bowel preps, right? You can, you know, you do these, you do a bowel prep in a person who's significantly older, who runs risks from the electrolyte abnormalities that come from those things. All of those things have to be, you know, I, I certainly wouldn't want my 86 year old dad getting a colonoscopy under any circumstance. That ship has sailed, right? He, the bowel prep alone could injure him, let alone the sedation of it. So, so one has to be very thoughtful and measured in how they think about doing these things. Um, and I think the, the long answer to your question is, I think when people talk in blanket statements like cancer screening is bad, uh, they're generally speaking through the lens of policy and population. And it kind of leads to an, another question we saw come through quite a bit, which is, you know, sometimes on the podcast, it can get technical, can kind of get in the weeds. A lot of people were curious, how is the book compared to that in terms of technicality? Is it something that obviously if you're an MD, PhD, you're going to be able to understand? But what about for just the layman? Do you think they'll be able to get as much out of the book? And was that kind of the hope and how you wrote it? And my guess is we can get Bill's response to. I but. was actually going to turn this question <laughs> over to Bill first, and and then I'll I'll throw I'll chime in. But I, I'd like to hear Bill's thoughts on that. I I have a strong thought on this. But. Well, I I think we're both fascinated, probably you more than me. But go with you know we kind of can kind of go down these rabbit holes of of you know the technical details, which I call the alphabet soup. You know, once you start stringing together a lot of acronyms like uh, APOE and you know. PSAN and all this stuff, it turns into alphabet soup. Um, and I, I sort of think of the podcast as like your playground to, to go deep with these scientists. And it's tremendously valuable, right? Because they don't have really other, a lot of other, you can't go on fresh air as a scientist and, and get into that level of detail. But um, I would say it's considerably less technical than, than the podcast, but the, you know, the basic message and the, the kind of the large, you know, we cover a lot more ground, so we can't really go deep too deep on any one particular topic. Like I was listening to um, uh, the, the the episode about HDL, mm, super Raider. interesting, but like mind-bogglingly complicated, and we just didn't have the time or the the need to go that deep. And you know, I do hope that you know they figure out how to enhance the function of AD HDL. But yeah, we there were probably go that some far. sections. Actually, that's interesting. The cardiovascular section, pretty detailed. We, we go pretty detailed in that section. But we have to. We and, and again, I think part of it is we're we're trying to add enormous value in writing this. Right? Like, there's there's a lot of kind of me too books out there on this subject matter, and by me too, I just mean like <laughs> it's just another book that is literally adding no value. Saying the same thing. Yeah, it's just saying yep. the same thing. And and our goal here was like, there's no chapter in this book none that should ever just be another version of checking that box. And so on the chapter of atherosclerosis, I mean, yeah, I think we do go probably <laughs> deeper than certainly our editor would have wanted. Um, I think she was kind of to her credit, just accepted the fact that she might not understand every word of it, but um, it's, you don't need to necessarily understand every word of it to understand what to do about it. And, and, and if you do want to go deeper, cause we do get into HDL and we do comment on the fact that HDL functionality is not captured by HDL cholesterol and HDL particle number and APOA concentration and all of those things. And we do have to talk about the Mendelian randomizations and what they've taught us with respect to HDL cholesterol and what they haven't taught us and things like that. So, um, that's probably, yeah, that's probably a little more technical than maybe the average person would want. But, but I, I, you know, I, I think that overall this book is very readable. 
by a person who is curious. And I agree that it is definitely a notch below the technical um, depth of what we often do in our podcasts. It's not a, it's not meant to be a textbook either, but kind of the way I think of it is you want people to learn think learn more than they expected without even realizing that they're learning. You know, kind of like package it in a story or a metaphor. And the atherosclerosis chapter is is a good example of that because you know most people know everybody knows about good and bad cholesterol. And uh, I think Peter got a little triggered by that. And we just, we're just going to go to town. And in the writing process, what was it, how was that like between the both of you in the sense of, were you often trying to keep Peter in check in terms of the scientific aspect of it, trying to bring stories in kind of how, how would you both do that throughout? Because obviously the book is, I mean, it's a good chunk now. It clearly could be four times as long if you went into the detail that you could go. So kind of where in the writing process did you decide, okay, th like this deserves to go deep, this doesn't? Was there ever disagreement about that or kind of how did that work? Yeah, I mean, I think Bill um, always thought about it through the lens of the reader. And I think there was a very healthy tension between us on those things for sure. Um, and I say healthy because it was never, I don't, I don't think, I think both of us would sit here and say never once did we have a disagreement that was about ego, right? We had lots of disagreements about content, but it was like Bill saying, I don't think a reader needs to know this. And I'm saying, Bill, I think a reader does need to know this. And it wasn't about like, I want to put this in because it's mine. Like it, it was never about that kind of stuff. So, so yeah, I think there was always a great and healthy tension about that. Um, I think once, you know, there's a backstory here, which I, we didn't really get into, but this book basically got killed in 2020 and then it died. It, like it was left, it was left for dead. And it only got revisited with a whole new publisher and a whole new editor and a whole new process. And so that process, which went for, which was now 2021 into 2022, introduced a new player into the mix, which was our editor at Penguin. And um, I, I don't have anything to compare Diana to as far as other editors, but she struck me as relatively hands off. I, I, is that, would you, yeah, yeah. That, so would, she would she be described as more of a hands, more of a conceptual editor as opposed to a line editor? Yeah. And she gave great sort of, um, you know, guidance and, um, you know, she had some give and take, but I think between you and I, like we, it took us about six months to kind of get the right voice and register, right? Like how, who are we writing this book for? Yeah. And I, I think you weren't quite clear. No, I think initially was I was, I'm writing this like I would write a scientific article. I'm writing this like I would be writing in a journal, a scientific journal. For and, people who know. And I think like, Bill yeah. initially was like, no, 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 we're going to write this more like, I'm making this up. It's not what was actually said, but like, we're going to write this for USA Today. And I think in the end, we probably settled on, you know, the New Yorker slash the New York Times slash the Wall Street Journal. Like it's, it's halfway in between and it's the right voice. It is, and again, I go back to, I finally realized it's absolutely written the way it should be based on how it sounded when I finally read the book out loud, which by the way, we dodged a bit of a bullet because I was given this advice by Sam Harris a couple of years ago and I didn't follow it because I never had the time. But Sam said to me, do not do your edits silently. When you are editing this book, read it out loud. And yeah, that's good writer's advice. Yeah. And yeah. I was like, I mean, I acknowledged what he said and I never had the time to do it. Cause when push came to shove, this is like nights and weekends. And if I got to get through a 5,000 word section, <laughs> like I don't have the freaking time to sit there and read that out loud. And so as we got closer and closer to that reading, my anxiety was peaking because I was like, I haven't actually sat here and done this exercise. 
And there were a lot of last minute edits that came out of that. Probably many more than anybody would have been comfortable. I mean, I think you said 400. Really? Yeah, yeah, we you pushed it to the very end. Yeah. And also not, not only like line edits, but also like, hey, we just saw this study about, about Tau deposition oh, in, in women. women. Yeah, yeah, I remember that study. More, like, can we put this in? Bill's like, no, like, oh my there's God, no room going crazy. For this. But I think just kind of going back to something you said, like a lot of times you you kind of come up with something or some idea or there'd be some new study about Tau. Can we put this in? It's like, well, we'd find a way to do it, right? That, that worked and kind of weave it in, massage it in. Yeah. But but a lot of times it would be, you know, you realize like something so significant might only warrant a sentence in a book of this nature. And yeah, I, I think that was just a general process of getting comfortable. But it is the way these things need to be done. And I really, I'm glad, I'm really glad with the way this turned out because if this had been written in the voice that the first version had been written in, it would have been accessible to so many fewer people. It just would have yeah, it should have been yeah. a turn off to people. I mean, I think, you know, I, the feedback again from that first version was not just that it's so technical, but there is no story in here. There's right. no protagonist. There are no journeys. There's nothing to follow. And um, and that was one of Diana's insights. Like, what's the thread that pulls the reader? That was her big thing. Yeah. What's the thread that pulls the reader through the book? And they were there. We just had to kind of expose them and let them kind of shine. You know, one of the questions we get asked a lot, which is, you often said this is the only book you're ever going to write. And a lot of people are like, there's no way. And I think even Bill joked that he doesn't think this is the only book you're going to write. And whenever people would ask, I'd always be like, oh, there's not a chance Peter writes another book. Like, there's no way. But as I'm hearing you talk now, I'm kind of thinking to myself, how do you not write another book in 10 years <laughs> on an update to all this? So how do you, because I know you, you went into this being like, look, I want to write one book. I want it to contain everything, which is why you did the objective strategy tactics like we talked. What makes you think that you'll actually never write another book? I mean, again, I think if we're being reasonable people, we could never say never, right? Um, I just think a couple of things would have to be true for me to write another book. So I, I, I'd say that. Um, one thing that would have to be true is I would have to have something to say. Like you, you, I think this process is so difficult. At least, I mean, I see these people that write a book a year. I don't understand how they're doing it. Um, so I, again, let's just put those people aside. But for someone like me to do this with the unbelievable inertia that's required to do it, the, the desire, the drive to need to say something must be so great that, that you have to be able to overcome that pain. So, so that's, that's condition number one. I would have to have something so overwhelming to talk about. The second condition is I would have to be at a different place in my life than I am today. I would not want to repeat what I have done for the past five years, which is work on something so difficult on nights and weekends. This has been, um, I, I think it's just been, it, it's just, it's, I've paid a price for it that is probably higher than I would like to have paid. And I don't want to do that again. So, so I think the second equally important condition is I will need to be at a point in my life where I'm not working 24 seven and writing this will not kill me. Meaning it's not something I have to do nights and weekends. I can write it during the daytime. And that just means my life looks different than it looks today, right? That means my kids are a lot older. That means I'm not working as hard on my practice or other things as I am today, where those are my jobs and this is my hobby. So I think if those two conditions were met, if I had something really amazing to write about or update or tweak, um, and I could do it in a civilized manner, I would be open to it. One of the questions that we got came through, which I thought was really interesting and fits well with the thread you just went on is, did you want or need to write this book? Because you hmm. can mention it there. There's obviously no shortage of books on health, books on longevity whatever you want to call it. And so what, going back to the framework you just laid out, 
what do you think to you was so important to say that you were like, I need to get this out there and I need people to have these insights? I think it's hard to speak to the motivation at the outset because when when I started this in 2016, it was, you know, two years before having a podcast. So it never occurred to me at that time to have a podcast or I probably would have had a podcast. And maybe if I did have a podcast, I wouldn't have thought to write a book because in some ways a podcast is an easier way to communicate. It's less formal, but it's easier, right? You can, and you can communicate much more through a podcast. So I think the more interesting question for me to think about is let's go back to where we were in December of 2020, Bill. So, so basically in this, in February of 2020, this project is nuked. It's dead. We're done. Publishers fired me. And nobody wants a book about longevity in the pandemic anyway. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's, it's over and I'm over it. Right. Like I'm so frustrated that, uh, and I feel bad that I've wasted so much of Bill's time because he's put in two full years at that point and he's going to have nothing to show for it. Right. Like he's not going to have a book to show for it. Um, for me personally, I don't care. Like I don't need a book, whatever. Um, and so I, I don't know, Bill and I probably didn't talk for nine months. It was sort of done. Like it was, I mean, I was like, you know, I felt bad and, but he, he you know, and, and Bill didn't make me feel bad or anything like that. That was just the nature of things. Right. We, so, so we kind of, that was the end of it until late, late, late 2020 when Michael Ovitz somehow asked me about it and I don't know what brought it up. We were talking about his book, which I love. And somehow it came up that, oh, I, I'd kind of written a book too, but you know, it sort of got scrapped. And he was like, oh, send it to me. And so I called Bill and I was like, hey, Bill, do we still have the G-Doc that has like whatever the last version was of that thing before it died? And he's like, yeah, I could probably find it. And I was like, do you mind sending it to me? So he did. And I sent it to Michael. And I remember this was around Christmas of 2020. He read it in two weeks, which is saying something because it was a pretty long ass thing. Yeah. And he said, look, man, this has got to be published. And I was like, well, we don't have a publisher. And I explained all the, you know, how much hair was on this dog. And, and then the rest is kind of history. He just said, well, yeah, 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 no, no. He goes, look, I, I, you know, we'll get this published. Um, so that's really the, the, the question then becomes why at that moment in time that I go back in the ring, <laughs> cause I was clearly out of the ring. I was, I, you know, um, and by that point we had a podcast. I mean, this was not like, I wasn't looking for things to do. And honestly, I think it kind of comes down to some of the stuff I write about in the very last chapter of the book. I think, I think there was a, a coming to peace with some of some of my demons and a realization that I wanted to do it. I really did have a, I, I really had a strong desire to put this material out there in basically the form it's in now, which um, turned out to be such a blessing. I, if had it not been for getting fired by the old publisher, had it not been for COVID, had it not been for all of the crises that emerged, this book looks a lot different. And truthfully, I think it's not as good. Um, but to answer your question, I, I think it was want more than need, but I don't think that want really found its why until the end of 2020, the beginning of 21. Yeah, Bill. So hearing that, I mean, what are your thoughts on that process. And also during that nine months of silence to you, did you ever think the book would see the light of day? I think deep down, I, I knew that it would because there had been so much work that went into it and there was so much that's original and interesting and amazing in it that I, I, I felt like it would be a, a tragedy if it wasn't published. And I was kind of depressed and sad for a while that it, it wasn't. So I was very glad to get your call about your friend Michael Ovitz wanting to see it. I was like, yes, mm -hmm. this is going to happen. And, you know, I think it was kind of interesting watching Peter kind of like become 
a writer in certain ways, you're talking about like working on nights and weekends and you're just kind of tortured by this thing that's like hanging over your head and it won't go away and you have, it has to be good. It has to be perfect, right? And so one of the stages of that process is deciding that the whole thing sucks. And, you know, there's all kinds of stories about writers throwing their, yeah. all their manuscripts in the fire and like, ah, they're, you know, and, and, and it's a process you have to go to and go through. And, and especially in science writing, right? There's, there's like a first draft that, that, you know, we, we call it like the shitty first draft and you, you have to write it. And it doesn't mean you're a shitty writer or a shitty thinker. It's just, you're just getting it all out there. And then it's like, what do we got? Right. And then the process, you think you're done, right? Because I remember finishing the first drafts, like, okay, sweet, I'm done. And I think at about that point, you had sent me an espresso machine. Mm. It's like, this was nice of Peter to send me this espresso machine now that we're done. But we weren't done. We weren't even close. You know, you've got the first draft. It's like you run the first half of the marathon. Like, don't put the sticker on your car. You got to run the other half of the marathon before you're done. So, yeah, it was a... It was a marathon. And, and like a marathon, anybody who's run one or swum one or bike, you know, done these things, you know that the physiologic halfway point is not the exact actual halfway point. Yeah. Like a, yeah. most, you know, my wife just ran a marathon recently and uh, uh, we, you know, in training for this, I mean, it was all about the training for the physiologic hits. And in that 26 miles, you don't physiologically hit the half point till 20. So you'll hurt as much in the last 6.2 miles. You will, it will be as difficult metabolically and physiologically in the last six miles as the first 20 were. And I think the same is I, I, exactly the same for this writing process, right? The, yeah, what yeah. we did in the last nine months was more valuable yeah. than the previous five years. Right. And I, I'd kept telling you that through the process, like, you got to trust it's, this it's, process. Yeah, yeah, you got to trust it, and it's going to get a lot better in the last six months than in the first, however many many years. And that's just the nature of the beast. I remember this summer, uh, sorry, last summer. So it was July of 2022. Um, we were on a pretty tight deadline at this point. So this was when Penguin said this book has to come out in March. And if you reverse engineer that, the manuscript needed to be final by the first week of September. And we were six weeks away from <laughs> that. And there were gaping holes in this thing. Like yeah. you could drive a tractor truck through some of the holes in this thing. And I had a feeling that I have not had since... I was on a very difficult swim in 2008-2009 where I was in the water and nothing was going well. This was actually early on after I tore my labrum and I was in so much pain and um the current was moving in the wrong direction. E everything was going wrong. And you know, these things are very psychological. You know, you 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 it's just like running, it's like cycling. I mean, once your brain is hurting, like nothing, nothing goes right. And I remember at one point realizing I still had seven hours to swim and every stroke, I felt like someone was sticking a dagger into my shoulder. And there was just a part of me that was like, I don't want to do this anymore. I just don't want to do this. And I remember thinking for at least an hour, all I thought about was quitting. All I thought about was just getting out of the water. All I had to do was put my hand up and touch the boat and I was disqualified oh. and the swim was over. Um, and I didn't, you know, for better or worse, I kept swimming. I don't think it changed anything in my shoulder. I'm still going to need shoulder surgery regardless. But I came back to this in July of 2022 and I remember talking about this with Jill. And I remember thinking, in the next six weeks, we will have to work so hard to get this thing submitted and we don't have a choice now meaning we can't stretch that out for six months it's you have six weeks to finish do what you can in six weeks and i remember saying to jill i'm so torn right now because i am so tired 
I don't want to do anymore. And I know that for, I know that our publisher would accept this right now as is because it's good enough. Yeah. But in my mind, it's not good enough. And the only way this thing is going to be good enough to what we think it deserves is I'm going to have to kill myself for the next six weeks. Everything I do will revolve around this and I will have to rewrite and rewrite and chop out and do, and do all these things. And I just, I just remember saying to Jill, like, I want to quit right now. I j I've never wanted to quit so bad and quitting. This is a soft quit. It's just a saying, I'm going to back off. It's not that I'm not uh -huh. going to finish. I'm just going to back off. And I'm glad that I didn't. I don't know how you felt at that point, but that's, I really Pretty was similar. like, I'm done with this. I don't even know if I care anymore. Nobody, most people won't notice the difference between this version and the version we might be able to get to in six weeks. Yeah, I, I think one, one thing we share in common is, is maybe you're more than me, but like a kind of, um, all, like a perfectionism. And to me, that goes to the the sort of the level of the writing, right? Is this that I would be going through every single sentence? Like, is this the best way that this sentence mm -hmm. can be cast, or are these in the right order? You know, how are we structuring this? I was doing that constantly, and and spent that most of that summer doing doing just that. And it was, um, yeah, it felt like in a pretty deep hole and the deadlines looming, but you know, deadlines are good, right? Cause like nothing would be finished yeah. without a deadline. So at a certain point you have to like take your hands off it and say, all right, this is, this is, this is what it is. That but it did get a lot better it, it, even between then and, and you know, when they finally yanked it out of our, our cold dead hands, um, it got better, got a lot better, more readable. Yeah, that was yeah. that was the proverbial darkness before light. <laughs> was that August September was really hard, um, but I'm, and that's what I think every person was trying to tell me before, which is you have to trust how much this is going to converge at the end. Yeah, it's kind of funny hearing that timeline because by the time this comes out, we'll have released a podcast with Ethan Weiss, and you guys were talking about blood pressure on it. You're like, you know, Ethan, my blood pressure has always been normal. But in August, <laughs> I started taking a reading and it just was higher, but I could calm down. And he was like, well, did anything change during that time? And you were like, yeah, I had a book deadline. <laughs> so it's kind of funny to just see how much this book has tried to kill you along the way of not only the blood pressure, the voice, yeah. just every little bit of stress. Yeah. Yeah. Ironically. Yeah. Let's talk about the audiobook. You kind of mentioned it there. I know you struggled a lot with should I read this or should I not? And part of it was, you know, you've said yourself, like sometimes like reading that much, like you'll struggle with. It was not only that, it was the time aspect, the commitment. What made you ultimately decide to read it? Because the overwhelming feedback we got from the audience was they didn't want to hear someone else read this book if it wasn't you and people and I think this is where kind of having your own podcast probably hurt you is everyone knew your voice and knew what it sounded like you weren't a voiceless figure who was just a writer so what made you ultimately decide all right I'm gonna go do this audiobook well I mean first I should explain why I didn't want to do it and I think I had some pretty good reasons for not wanting to do it uh, first of all I'm not a great um, out loud reader um, I think I do have mild dyslexia. Um, I, I certainly do when it comes to spelling. So I can't spell if my life depends on it. Um, and when you hear me read, even to my kids, uh, it, like, you know, Reese is eight, so he can read. So if I'm reading to him, he's catching mistakes that I'm, he's catching words that I'm flipping back and forth. Um, so that was one reason there was just like, uh, this is going to be very hard for me to do. The second is I did the math pretty quickly, meaning I had figured out how long it took me to read a page. I multiplied it by how many pages there were in the book. And I knew that I was going to basically be in a recording studio for two weeks. I also knew that that meant that that was 
the one week a year that I kind of wind down is between Christmas and New Year's. I was going to be in a recording studio all day, every day. And I just knew how I felt, which was I'm exhausted. I'm exhausted and I don't, I actually need a week to recharge. I don't need two more extra weeks of work. The third thing was when Rick Rubin was in town visiting over the summer, he was beginning the process of recording for his audiobook, and he had a sound engineer set up a studio in our basement. So he was beginning to do his read. They, they, he and his family stayed with us for a couple of weeks. And one day he was like, hey, why don't you go in the studio with my engineer and just read a bit and see how it goes? And I was like, all right, that's not a bad idea. So I did. And I read it and I sent it to you guys. And you guys finally acknowledged what I was saying, which was, yeah, that's pretty rough. Like, dude, there's no intonation in your voice. Like you're, you sound like a robot reading that. So now we've got confirmation on my worst fear, which is I'm a lousy reader, coupled with all these other things. And I, you know, so, so, so that, those were all the reasons I didn't want to do it. And I think those were all very compelling. So on the flip side of that, I, I don't remember who suggested it, if it was you or somebody suggested that I at least meet with this woman named Stacy Snell, who I guess is it kind of a freelancer, but works for Penguin and she would be the producer director of my audiobook. And like maybe Stacy had just said, let me, let me go and spend an afternoon with Peter and do some coaching. So sure enough, one day, and this is probably like November, she comes over here and we do some reading. And for two hours we read, but she coached me on reading and she gave me some really amazing tips that seem so self-evident but uh, they made a difference. So for example, first is read slower, right? And, and I should have known this because I consume virtually all of my books in audio first, and then certain ones I go back and read in paper. But I listen at about 1.8 to 2x, depending on the author. And so in my mind, that's the cadence of an audio book. But if you ever actually go and listen to an audio book on 1x, I mean, it sounds like this. So what she reminded me was, you know, it needs to sound pretty slow at 1x speed. The other thing she said is, and she could tell right away, she's like, you're not present when you're reading. It's clear huh. to me how bored you are of this book, and I can't blame you for it. You've read every word a thousand times, but your boredom is showing in your reading. She's like, a good reader reads this like it's the first time they've seen these words. She's yeah. like, you have to get there. And I was like, wow. And she's like, oh, and by the way, reading slow makes that easier. The slower you read, the easier it is for you to be present with every word. So armed with Stacy's feedback, I... I decided I'm going to do this. Um, and so a couple days before starting it, I had a th session with one of my therapists. And obviously one of the things you talk about in therapy is like, what are you, what are you worried about? What do you know? What's, what's going on in your life? And I said, well, you know, I'm really worried. And you know, a couple of days I start this reading process. And so Katie said, well, what's your why? Why are you doing this? And let's write those down. So I had three reasons why I was writing this. And I wrote those three reasons down on a piece of paper. And those were with me in the recording huh. studio. And the three reasons were very simply, um, one, <clears throat> the, the listeners of the podcast will expect this and deserve it. Uh, in other words, you know, we feel really grateful. Obviously, I don't need to just say this, but you know, we have a very loyal group of listeners to this podcast. Um, and to your point, there is an expectation that the person who whose voice they listen to is the one that reads it. Uh, and I think it's, a, it's I think it's a correct expectation. I think they deserve that. Um, the second is a pet peeve of mine when I'm listening to technical books that are not read by the author is how many mistakes huh. there are when things are read incorrectly. It bothers me to no end. I mean, I remember listening to one book where the author had written the word causal multiple times. And every time the word causal was misread as casual. Oof. I mean, it's like, 
how that got missed, I don't know. But, but you know, I thought about how many technical words are in this book and I was like, I'm going to lose my mind if a person, <laughs> and I basically said, I'm going to end up having to be in the recording studio anyway, yeah. just to make sure everything is said um, correctly. Um, and then the third reason was just a very personal one, which was, you know, right now, none of my kids are old enough to appreciate this book. None of them are going to read this book anytime soon, but one day they will, and one day they might listen to it. Um, and, in, and in fact, I thought further, and this is kind of a weird thing to think about because we don't normally think this way, but <clears throat> like imagine Hemingway had read some of his audio books and now like distant relatives of his could, could listen to it and listen to him reading it. And I thought like long after I'm dead, my great grandkids could still listen to this, but they'll hear me reading it. And I think that will be more valuable than hearing someone else read it. So it was really more of like something for kids and grandkids to one day have. But it's also, you know, there there are a lot of stories in there about yes. your early life and yep. your your medical career, and you know, some there's some fairly dramatic, you know, ER stories, and you know, your story is kind of like embedded throughout the book, and especially in the last chapter. Um, so I think it would have, like, you had to read it. You just didn't realize it. Yeah, I think that's true. But it is a daunting and, and kind of terrifying uh, task at the same time. But I don't know. Are you glad you did it? Oh, I'm 100%. Yeah. I'm 100% glad I did. Zero regret on that. Um, and and just glad with the way it turned out. Glad with the, you know, having Stacy there in my ear for the whole thing was was incredible. I, I, I couldn't imagine if I had to do it with somebody else. Yeah, it's it's funny. Is there'll be a lot of times where you'll be like, um, you know, we'll be like, Peter, you got to do this. And I'll be like, no, I, I suck at this. Like, I can't do it. And it's like, okay, yeah, yeah. Like, just go ahead and do it. And you're like, okay. And you send it. And it's like, yeah, this is totally fine. And I think that's what we all expected when we <laughs> sent over the sample from the studio in the basement. I remember listening to it. And you're like, he's right. And I was like, this is bad. <laughs> like, there is no sugarcoating it. Like, yeah. it was, and I remember talking to Lacey and I was like, I honestly think it's so bad because people hear him talk on the podcast and clearly you can speak, but you sounded like you'd never read anything in your life. And like you were a caveman dropped in and you were just like, what is all this stuff around me? Right. So you've got these phonetic symbols <laughs> and like go. Yeah. And it was, <laughs> it, it was just a conversation of, yeah, we, we can't let him do this. This is, <laughs> this is going to be embarrassing. Um, but then Stacy came in and really cleaned it up. And I, I know I listened to some of the audio and it, it does sound really good. So to see that progression, maybe down the road, we'll release a snippet of the initial, just so people can hear the difference of it <laughs> because it's, it's blackmail material. Yeah, it's, it's strong. Or actually really, we got to make sure Stacy does a before after on her website or something like yeah. working with me, will get you from here to here. <laughs> before and after. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. That's funny. And you kind of talked about it earlier where you know reading the book caused you to make some edits some some edits <laughs> which 563 or was it I mean, 863 i think that's the closest bill and diana came to wanting to kill me i think if they could have if they could have killed me and nobody would have found out about it they probably would have and been like oh God, so tragic that something happened to Peter this week. Well, you know, anyway, posthumously, yeah. we, uh, we'll, we'll publish this book with your name on it. We'll release it as is. I think there, there is a little Easter egg in the audio version as well that's a little different too, which probably also led to some of Diana's stress. Do you kind of want to talk about that piece of it? Sure. So the before before we turned the book over to Penguin, so back when, you know, it was in the the old version that died, um, you know, it was a very similar structure to the way it is now, just a much longer, less elegant version. Um, but there was an ending to that chapter. So, so the end of the book, the 17th and final chapter had, a, had an ending. And um, I loved it. Bill was sort of ambivalent. Um, when Diana saw it, she hated it. She was like, I don't get it. This sucks. And I was like, what do you mean you don't get it? I even like sent her YouTube videos to help her understand it, to get the reference. She's like, I don't get it. It's, it's the dumbest thing I've ever seen. This is awful. 
And at this point, Bill was like, ah, I kind of see Diana's point. Like, I, I don't think it's good. And I was like, yeah. and I was like, all right, fine. So they took it out. So we took it out. And this is, you know, this is months ago. Like it's long been forgotten. So I'm in the studio finishing and I finish the whole book. And I said to Stacy, I said, hey, Stacy, do you want to see the alternative ending? And she's like, what do you mean? And I was like, this book ended with a totally different thing. It, it, where you see it ending now, there used to be a whole page after this. And she's like, oh, really? Let me see it. I was like, let me see if I can even find it. So I'm like rummaging through my computer and I find it and I, I give it to her and I'm like, read it. And she reads it and she's in tears. And I was like, what do you think of that ending? She goes, I think it's beautiful. And I was like, well, what do you think? Do you want me to read that? And we can decide if maybe that goes in. And she's like, yeah, I'd go. So I went back in the booth and I read it. And I go home that day and I email Bill and Diana and I'm like, all right, guys. And by the way, you got to put this in context. They are at the point of wanting to kill me for changing <laughs> words at this point. Literally, I'm like, can we get rid of the the here? And, uh, you know, this word needs to be like this versus this. Like, and I'm saying, I want to add another page and a half to this manuscript. Like, it's going to screw up everything. And I won't get into the details of those conversations. They were not pleasant. But suffice it to say, the answer was, oh, hell no. And so I accepted the fact that it would never make its way into the written version of the book. But I said, but would you at least entertain this being in the audio version? And they were like, of course not. Like, you can't have the audio version and different from the written version. Um, and, I, and we kind of left it at that, I think. But then I asked Stacy to send it once it was edited. And I just forwarded it on to Bill. So it sounds good the way you read it. So I was like, this sounds this is good. This is moving. Tried to find a place to kind of massage it in or put it in someplace, maybe not as the ending, but but someplace in the manuscript. And it, that kind of didn't work because, I mean, that without going into detail, like that last chapter probably evolved the most of any chapter in the book. And we'd kind of gotten to a place where it was working and, and that part had dropped out. So kind of decided as a compromise to leave it in the audio as the kind of like director's Stanley Kubrick director's cut, you know? Um, and and I think it's great. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, honestly, like I, I feel like as far as print, like the last few paragraphs of the book and especially like the last line is something that like sticks with me. Mm. And I think about that. I think about that every day, that line, and I won't say what it is, but every day when I walk the dogs, I think about that. I think when I'm thinking about like, what's, what am I going to do today? Like, how am I thinking about mm. this day and, and the week to come and everything? I, I, that line sings in my head. So, yeah. So I'm I think, I think we, there. I think we captured the best of both worlds. I think, I think it makes sense. Um, I think it would have been, even, even if we thought it could have been shoved in at the end, I think it would have been logistically impossible because of how it changes the pages of the book and stuff like that. So I think it's an elegant way to do it. And, and I know that also if people are anything like me, like a lot of times you want an audio book and you want the paper book. You want to put your, fold your pages. You want to mark it over. You want to, you know, um, do that kind of stuff. So um, I think it worked out just fine. And I, I was, I was, you know, frankly, I was glad you were, on some level that you were making like little line edits and stuff like, cause you know, it, it, it makes it better. You know, there's always stuff you can find that, that, you know, I did a lot of things that you probably didn't even notice, but you know, no, it got, it, it got so much better. I yeah. mean, it, it, there is like a huge sprint at the end to just make this thing sound right. Yeah. And you're, you're getting these like PDFs from the publisher, like, okay, your book's done. Here's your PDF. Just proofread it and see if there are any spelling mistakes. And of course, I think we kind of both went to town on it. it typically, I guess, uh, I guess the industry standard is you would do three passes on the PDF final copy. So they 
you, you know, once you are out of working into, in a, you know, Word doc, you're into a, fi a fully typeset PDF copy. And it's expected that like the first round of passes on that, you might find some mistakes. The second, by the third round, there's none. We got up to six or seven passes on a PDF. I mean, these people are going, you know, they were incredibly patient with us. The lovely people at Penguin Random House worked very hard to absolutely they were accommodate all of our last minute changes. <laughs> and they also now understand why we say with you, the only thing you do in moderation is moderation. That's right. Um, it also is just really funny to just think about the aspect of they probably thought of you like a child. Like we left Peter unsupervised to record this book and he just totally went off script. <laughs> um, and speaking of things that kind of we joke like, what could go wrong, did go wrong, voice, everything else. You want to talk about the first day in the recording studio, what happened? God. So we had two recording studios to choose from in Austin. And I don't know, I just was like, Stacy's like, it's totally up to you. Which one do you want to do? And I was like, well, this one seems a little closer to my house than that one. And given that I'm going to be over there every day, uh, let's minimize the commute. So we went to the closer one. So first day we go in there. And, um, I, I sit down and I just, we just jump right into it and right, right out of, and then you read the, I'm reading the book in chronological order, of course. Um, I just hear like a weird little hissing sound and I call out to the engineer and I say, Hey, do you hear that? And he says, yeah, but that's not being picked up on the recording. I said, okay. And I can. I can get over it. Like it's annoying, but it's like, I can, I can work through it. So I keep reading, get through the introduction, get through chapter one. I'm like, are you, I mean, it's getting louder. Are you sure it's not being picked up on the mic? He goes, no, I can tell you it's not being picked up on the mic. And I'm like, yeah, this can't be right because I can hear it with my ears off the, off the speak. Like, you know, you're wearing a headset in there. And it's not coming uh. through the headset. It's it's what I'm hearing in the room. And I know how sensitive the mics are in those studios. I mean, they're insanely, they're so sensitive that if you're moving your feet on the floor, it's being picked up. So we keep having this back and forth where he keeps insisting that this is not being picked up. And I, I, I just finally said like, I don't, I'm not gonna tell you I know your world, but I know how recording works. And if I can hear this with my ears, off sound in the recording studio, it must be picked up. And then he kind of pivots and says, well, we'll be able to strip it out in post. And I'm like, okay, so it is being picked up. So finally, I'm one paragraph away from finishing the third chapter, which was all we were gonna get through that day. That's a big day to get through the intro and then three chapters, but they were short chapters, but still it's a full day of reading. And I remember this, I had literally one paragraph to go and we were done for the day. And he goes, you know what? I think we are picking it up. I'm like, what? He goes, I think there's a, it's a grounding issue. So to make a long story short, we ended up having to go to the other studio anyway, because they, we couldn't record there. And they assured me that they would be able to fix that in post and they could not. So when I finished the book, they were like, you got to come back and reread that first day again. But I think that also was a good thing in a weird way because I think I was a better reader by the end than I was at the beginning. And so in a, in a way, I got a day to practice where it didn't count. Yeah, it is, it's funny how it ended up, you ended up getting a free practice run, which at the time, I don't know if we thought of it that positively, like wasting a day on something you were dreading doing. But I think the audio version ended up really well. You know, one of the last questions that we got, which I think is a really interesting question based on the whole conversation we had, and I think we can start with you, Bill, because I'm curious what you think as it relates to this, which is looking back at everything that ended up in the book, did you have a favorite chapter that you guys wrote? Is there anything that stands out where, like for whatever reason, you really look back fondly at that chapter? So it's sort of like um, picking favorite child, but um, geez. Uh, so there are these these four chapters 
kind of core chapters about the horseman diseases, right? Metabolic disorders, uh, atherosclerosis, heart disease, cancer, and Alzheimer's disease. And those were kind of, they were not in the original plan. Um, and kind of the way those all came together, um, it was a huge heavy lift to try and like understand each one of these disease processes really. And it took a huge amount of research and me spending time with Bob Kaplan, who was kind of our research guru for, for the, the book project and just kind of hammering these things out. Um, yeah, that, that was, that was pretty intense, a pretty intense experience. And I feel a, like a real sense of accomplishment about how those chapters all came out. I feel, I feel really good about them. But as far as like the chapter that, that progressed the most from like most improved, I think is, is the final chapter. Um, and just from where that started to where that ended up, I, I think, um, I think that has to be probably my favorite, favorite chapter. It's interesting because you didn't like that chapter initially. No. I know that you and no. Diana both didn't, that was probably your least favorite. And, and Michael was like, you know, in the early discussions we had, Michael was like, is, is this, it should be a separate book. Is this part of a, this yeah. book or is this part of a different yeah. book? The second book you're going to write. Mm -hmm. And I didn't agree with that either, but it, it had to change. And, and, you know, I'm always thinking about like, like Nick said, you know, where the, where the reader is coming from, like you said. Um, so that chapter ended up being one of my favorites, probably my favorite. I think there were sections of various chapters that I really like. I think that I think that the insights that come out of the atherosclerosis chapter are so important and probably have the potential to save more lives than anything else. I, I really think that um I don't pull any punches in my in my views on how we are mistreating, you know, this condition and why it does not need to be the leading cause of death no chance of that. And I, I do think that in a, and that's also one of those things where earlier versions of it didn't get to the point quick enough. Right. They had too right. much in it that didn't matter enough. And it was really a very late, late addition was that the really clear pivot to the causality stuff at the end that I think is a much more insightful way to talk about it. So I'm very proud with how that turned out. I think for me, the exercise chapters, there are three chapters on exercise, which speaks to the importance that that plays in this book. And that was probably the one where even as recently as like July or August of last year, I was like, I don't see how we get this to the finish line. Like, I don't see how this gets done. And we were trying at that time to do too much. And, um, and when we, when we instead focused on what we could do in a book, because again, it's not a picture book, right? This is not, this is not a how to exercise yeah. book where you're going to have like a picture of every single step of like, here's how no. to deadlift. Here's how to do this. No. Here's how to do that. And we were trying to do all of that in writing at one point. It had an incredible level of detail. Just it wasn't. Just wasn't happening. Couldn't make sense. Like you can't explain these things in writing. And so I think a big aha moment we had was A, let's restructure this, which we did. B, let's simply make a page of videos that explain some of these things so that we don't drown the reader in anatomic kinesthetic lingo that won't actually serve the purpose. And so when I look at how those three chapters form together and coalesce around the centenarian decathlon in the marginal decade, I'm, I'm, I'm really proud of that. And you mentioned Bob's name a few times, kind of both of you, but I know this was, uh, beyond just the two of you, there was a lot of people involved in the research, the writing, the science piece. So anyone else kind of, because one of the questions that we got was, you know, how many people do you think were involved in the writing of this book? 
Well, Bob did the heaviest lifting in terms of the, because, because, you know, Bob was working on kind of the research full time. So basically the way it would work is I would be writing and I would be saying, Bob, I, I remember there was a study that sort of had this, like, I mean, the end notes on this book are probably 500, right? So there's just a, probably more yeah, than that, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, so I would say, Bob, you know, can you go and find me the citation of this study? I kind of vaguely remember reading it a year ago, blah, 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 blah. Or it would be, you know, I want to write about this. Is the answer this or this, Bob, can you go figure it out? So this was, you know, this was really important research that was being done. But then the other thing that, that had to be done was all the fact checking. And one of the things that I took as, as wise advice from other authors who had written scientific books is you can't just rely on a publisher to fact check your book. They can fact check some things, but you have to have an independent person to come in and do scientific fact checking. So we had one analyst named Vin Miller who did a lot of that work. Because Bob was too close to it at the time, right? If Bob's the guy pulling the citations, can't have Bob fact check it. So had to have a separate analyst that was working on fact checking. And then once we got into a much, much later version, then we had Bob go back and do specific certain fact checks on certain things, which also meant, and God bless Bob, because this was long after Bob had left, <laughs> He came back and did a night weekend, like he was the guy that organized the endnotes, and that was another thing that just gave me chest pain. Like, I mean, the yeah, I mean, me the, too. <laughs> the unbelievable thought of what it would take to organize the endnotes to this book, and the version control problems that we had with multiple different documents. I mean, it was so stressful. Um, and by the way, it should go without saying, people are going to find mistakes in this. It's, it's, it's impossible that we got it all right. It's impossible that we got every end note perfectly. I, I guarantee you, we, we have a citation in there that we got wrong. Um, and you know, uh, that's why you have second and third editions to books. And, you know, so folks should let us know when they see those things and, um, and we'll do that. But, um, I think we did as good a job as, 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 as one could do in this regard. And, you know, having a lot of people to, to shoulder some of those lifts. I spent a lot of time kind of, kind of putting my head together and on zooms and, and going back and forth with Diana kind of when you were off doing things and kind of trying to work out the kind of literary side of, of the book and how to structure it and how to, how to make these different chapters kind of move better basically is for better way of putting it. Um, so I, I worked very closely with Diana and Bob, actually. Bob would give me the full research download on, on literally, I'd say like, hey, Bob, like, I'm, I'm trying to understand how APOE works. And boom, a GDOC would appear the next day with like tons of sites and studies and just go down, the, go down the rabbit hole with Bob about that. So he was great with that. Yeah, Bob has a endless number of g-docs like i, I would <laughs> love to know how he stores all of them because you ask bob a question you are getting a g-doc yeah in response i spent like weeks we probably all spent weeks talking about the, the monkeys the caloric restriction monkey studies i'm glad that they stayed in the book oh, yeah. i was really oh, yeah. worried yeah. that the bethesda wisconsin monkeys were going to get chopped but like, in God, the end they found the a great place yeah. for them and yeah. it's a fantastic story to tell there, there are a lot of folks in here that, that, you know, that I put in my acknowledgements. And, um, in fact, you know, it's pretty unusual. I think that an author will read the acknowledgements in the audio book, but, uh, there was no hesitation in my mind. It, 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 when we finished the book and I said, look, I'm going to not just read the epilogue, but the acknowledgements, they were like, oh, that's unusual. A lot of authors don't, but, um, you know, it's, uh, it's a it's a very sincere heartfelt thank you to a lot of people who have played an enormous role in sort of my broad education on this topic which has been going on for more than a decade and also some of the the real specifics um, so so you know broad education you know the podcast guests again the podcast started basically as a research tool for the book um and then of course one of the things i do mention in the acknowledgement section which is true and interesting 
every single person that I ever sent a chapter out to for technical feedback and review did so. There's not one person that I sent a chapter to, and every chapter of this book, every technical chapter has been reviewed by a mm -hmm. technical expert in that field. At least one. Yeah. At least one, that's right. And, and oftentimes at least, you know, more than one. There is not one example where I said, hey, dear so-and-so, can you read this cancer chapter? Can you read this athro chapter? Can you read this? Where that person didn't come back with incredible feedback. Um, and I'm, I'm, I mean, the word is overused, but I'm humbled by that. And that means a lot to me. And um, I think it makes this book a better book. When you decided to read the acknowledgments, did they try and get you to read the footnotes as well? Or is that not, <laughs> did that not make the audiobook? You know, it's funny. Um, I, and Bill, you probably don't even realize this, but I took a hit or miss approach on footnotes. Some of them I read and some of them I actually didn't. Oh, the ones at the bottom of the page? The true footnotes yeah, in the yeah, bottom of the yeah. page. Now, which obviously we took 98% of them out. Uh, you were delighted, I'm sure. And of the remaining ones, some of them I just felt they don't flow with the text. Like I, I'm trying to put myself in the mindset of the reader and, or the listener rather. And, you know, if the, if the footnote was so tangential that it would be difficult to get back into the book, yeah. I didn't read it. Yeah. There were some funny, funny tangents that maybe didn't need to be read or. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I think there was one about making all your, your dates read Richard Feynman. I definitely didn't read that one in the <laughs> book. Yeah. I don't even know if that oh, one stayed in the And book. Steven Rosenberg, you made them read the Transformed Cell Transformed also cell. Yeah, about that's right. immunotherapy. Mm -hmm. yeah, so. Well, Peter, Bill, anything either of you want to end with as we kind of end the podcast? And again, the, the hope going into this wasn't to answer specific questions about the book. I'm sure we'll do a podcast down the road, which is once people have had time to dive into it, like answer specific questions. Yeah, we'll do, we'll do, a, we should do a book AMA at some point. And obviously, you know, I've been on a few podcasts already for the book and the coming months, I will be on many podcasts. We have a number scheduled where we'll get into the book, uh, into the subject matter. But, but yeah, I think this was a unique opportunity to talk about the, something we'll probably otherwise never really talk about. A little yeah. behind the scenes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I would say it was, it was an honor and a pleasure to work with you. And, um, I learned a lot, obviously, but like, as far as like thinking and rethinking about these issues was, 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 it was, a, you know, exciting adventure and a little tough to get it on the page sometimes and get it just right. But I'm, I'm, I'm proud. I hope you are too proud of what we have come up with. I really am Bill. And I, I think it, it's hard to imagine this having worked out any other way. Um, so I'm glad that all the way back in 2017, they, they said, Peter, this will be a better book if you write it with someone and that, you know, they even back then trusted me to go and find who that person was. And I, I think, uh, I think this is the, this is the best book I could have ever been a part of. So thank you, Bill.